It was my mother who had found me, of course. She had heard both explosions from the kitchen, separated by at least a minute of quiet. Ever wondered why we're here? The first, she said, sounded like a very distant gunshot, or maybe a car backfiring. The second sounded like the roof collapsing. Where we're going? The upstairs landing was carnage, a minefield of fallen pictures, smashed glass, and displaced ornaments from the dresser that stood opposite the stairs. Pewter candelabra, a sacramental chalice, that kind of thing. What the point is? The bathroom door was closed, but not locked. I was lying on the floor in a pool of blood and shattered porcelain. Concerned about the state of the universe in general? Well, our latest book asks all those questions and more. My mother said that she screamed so loudly that it was probably this and not the explosion itself that brought Mr. and Mrs. Stapleton, our elderly neighbours, running. It was really a good job they turned up. I suspect my mother was way too hysterical to call an ambulance. The Universe versus Alex Woods by Gavin Extens. Hello again and welcome to the next book on the Richard and Judy Book Club, exclusive to WH Smith. This week we enter the world of science and fiction and are gripped by an intriguing tale right from the start. So we come to The Universe versus Alex Woods by uh, Gavin Extens. I, uh, I absolutely loved this book. It was uh, the very first one I read when Judy and I were selecting um, the, the, the summer reads. And I kind of knew by about page five, as one does, uh, that it was going to make it to the list because it's witty and clever and funny and original. I mean, what are the chances of being struck on the napper by a meteorite? Uh, vanishingly small doesn't cover it. But it happens to Alex Woods. And Gavin, I love the way as you describe this extraordinary event, which is utterly life-changing for Gavin, uh, for, uh, for, for Alex, um, the way that, that the world's population sees this meteorite coming in. They see this streak across the sky from continent to continent and the smoke trail behind it. And nobody knows, least of all, poor old Alex, that it's headed for his head. And it's gonna, that's, that's its, its destiny and therefore his. It's a wonderful concept to start a story. Um, where, where did that come from? Because the chances of it happening, as I said, are almost nil. They are. The chances are one in two billion. This right. came out of the research that I did. Some um, uh, Canadian astrophysicist with a lot of time on his hands worked out <laughs> the probability. Um, but, yeah, it's, I, I'm sort of a keen amateur astronomer, and this is the sort of thing that I, I spend my time worrying about, to be honest <laughs> with you. Is that one that I'm watching coming to get me? Exactly. Yeah. And I can't actually remember when... The idea specifically came to me, but I remember um, thinking there was something to it, and then I started researching, basically, if it was in any sense plausible. And, you know, I mean, one in two billion is plausible. Absolutely. So I did the research, and um, it transpired not only was it a possible scenario, but it's happened. It's, um, it happened to a, a lady in the 50s in Alabama. Really? What happened to her then? It's very similar to the... I sort of borrowed that, that setup for the book. Right. Um, she just lives in a small town in America, and it literally... Um, a piece of uh, meteorite came through her ceiling. She was reposing on the sofa in the account I read, and it struck her in the arm or the stomach, depending on which account you read. Mm. She was fine. And but it didn't hit her on the head? It didn't hit her on the head. It hit her either in the arm or the stomach. I'm not yeah. 100% which. Yeah. But um, Even so. it, it was just, it's one of those astonishing things and yeah. there's, there's pictures of it and Gosh. it's... Um, and with, and with yeah. Alex, there is, some, there is some speculation to begin with that he wasn't actually hit by the meteorite itself, but by the sort of the debris and the rubble and, the, and stuff. But actually, they do a check on his head and what, what, what trace elements do they find in his, on his napper? Oh, they, they find iron, nickel, cobalt and iridium-193. <laughs> this is just um, purely my own... The, the geeky... Ec elements of Alex's character and Alex's narration, yeah. it, it sort of it allowed me to play with that quite a lot. Mm. But I, I thought there was something really um, putting myself in Alex's position. If you were that boy, you would want to know for sure that you'd have been hit by the rock exactly. and not the ceiling. <laughs> so he has this sort of moment of triumph when the, the test results confirm that he's been directly hit. And, and the consequences of this, this singular event are not slight. Um, it puts him into a coma. Um, and and makes, basically makes him epileptic, um, presumably, for, for the rest of his life. But he's kind of used to being different and an outsider because of his mum, isn't he? He's, he's, he's used to being seen as this very separate, almost special person. D describe his extraordinary mum to us. I loved her character. So his mum's a, um, a clairvoyant. She reads tarot cards um, in a shop in Glastonbury. <laughs> 
and I think I knew very early on that I wanted there to be this sort of huge um, gulf at the beginning between Alex and his mother. Alex is very logical, analytical, um, a scientist at heart, mm. really. And his mum is um, slightly wacky, essentially. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Glastonbury is a place I love, and my wife's from that neck of the woods. So that, that was sort of, it was one of those details that, that felt really obvious that mm. when I, I came yeah. to it, it isn't obvious, but I thought, of course she's a clairvoyant. And, yeah, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. It yeah, works yeah. beautifully, it really does, as a counterpoint to his character. I'm, in, I'm interested in the, um, <clears throat> you say that Alex is really uh, a scientist at heart, very logical, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, And you, your background is that you were a chess champion, weren't you? Yes, when I was very young. Now, this is before I was 11. Right. Um, I used to play chess all the time from sort of the age of about 5 to 11. Yeah. And, yeah, there's probably an, an element. People always pick up on the chess. I think I've got, I've, I've done nothing of interest since from the age of 11. <laughs> so I've got a big <laughs> gulf in my, um, in my biography and the publicist had to come out with something. But nobody's interesting because, I mean, you, you, I mean, you played in Russia and everything, didn't you? These, these, I, I did, yeah. yeah. I, I, I played in Russia and it transpired that, that, that I thought I was quite good at chess, but the Russians are really good at chess. I think everyone else knew this, but as a, a sort of <laughs> ten-year-old, this game was, was quite a shock. I just wondered if, you know, to some extent Alex has a bit of biographical detail in him. Um, yeah, certainly. I, I think there's elements of me and Alex, or vice versa. So I'm never sh sure which, um, yeah. but I, I think Alex is a, a character who I wasn't like Alex at um, that period of adolescence. He's, right. he's 16, isn't he? When it, he's he, he's um, sort of 17, 18 17. when he's doing the, the when he's the point from which he's narrating the story. Yeah. But it, it covers the span of when he's um, yeah. 10 years old to when he's 18. Hmm. But that sort of period in adolescence, I think I went the other way to Alex. I was sort of the person who desperately wanted to fit in. Probably like 99% uh -huh. of adolescents. Yeah. And what I loved about writing Alex is he's not. He's sort of less than 1%. He's, uh -huh. he's his own person and has this sort of inner uh, strength and integrity at a time when that's sort of the hardest thing in the world to have. Well, he, rem he reminded me quite a lot, and I say this as a compliment, of, um, of uh, Holden Caulfield in Catcher in the Rye, you know. And, uh, Sam did. Is, is, was that an influence in the writing? Because uh, particularly in the opening of the book, he talks to us, the reader, in exactly the same way that Holden Caulfield speaks to us. You know, to be perfectly honest with you, he says it was this, and I felt that. And if I can be absolutely straight with you, I felt the other. And I like that. I found that very engaging. Was that an influence in, in your writing? It was. It was a big influence. Um, I read The Catcher in the Rye when I was 17, which is absolutely the perfect age to Me read too. that book. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And um, yeah, what I loved about the book. Um, it's sort of book. If you wrote the the plot on on a the back of an envelope, it doesn't it would exist. Be horrendous, but um, <laughs> that inclusiveness, that that it's such an engaging way of telling a story, and that's mm. absolutely something I had from the start. I knew what Alex's voice was going to sound like, mm. and I thought as well in Holden Caulfield, there's sort of there's a an innocence to his character that sort of mm. um, I I hope there are sort of comparisons with Alex there as well in lots of ways they're yes, very there, are, there are moments when Caulfield's in, in, in the lift with the horrible sort of um, porter at the hotel yeah. and he's punched in the stomach and doesn't see it coming and I, yeah. there were moments like, things happen to, to your character that he clearly does, doesn't see coming and I, I mean, hope you don't emulate Jakey Salinger in, in not writing <laughs> ever writing another book and disappearing into obscurity I've got a two book deal and <laughs> I, I, I think <laughs> so <laughs> they, well, they'll lock me in a room and make me write make another write book it, if yeah, it comes to that we don't want to give too, too much plot away here, but, but effectively uh, this, this, this encounter with the eternity almost um, turns, uh, turns Alex into a, a, a celebrity. Everybody wants a story. You write very engagingly that, that Richard and Judy, whoever they may be, um, offer to, um, to retile his roof and make it meteor proof in, in return for the exclusive, but he doesn't. What, personally? Personally. We'd retile it. Uh, I thought this was something in that scenario that you would do. And, <laughs> and um, you're not far off, actually. There was a time. There was a time. Um, and then everything changes when he meets Mr. Peterson, um, this, this, this gruff, seemingly at the, at the outset, hostile, uh, rather dangerous character. But that is a, that is a transforming moment in, in both their lives, actually. And the story then moves into a, a very different place. It is a story of, of, of many different colours and shades. And again, as a debut novel, I just find it extraordinary that you've, 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 you've hit the ground running so extraordinarily well. Is, is the next book going to continue with Alex as a character or is it going to be completely...? It's going to be completely different. I think Alex was always sort of... Uh, I always knew it was going to be a single book and the story 
gets to the point where it, it, it concludes and there's really sort of nothing else that can can happen. Mm. I mean, we've talked about improbability and I think there's only so many interesting things that can happen to one person in a lifetime. <laughs> and I like to think from sort of 18 onwards, Alex has, has a, um, a boring job that he finds fascinating doing research somewhere yes. and that will be the rest of his story and that's <laughs> fine. We don't need to know about that. I think some things are better left. And what was your day job till you started writing or is it still your I, day? I was a student for a very, right. very long time. I right. did a PhD. Um, I graduated right at the beginning of the recession All right. which felt like terrible timing on my part. Mm. So I was doing a lot of temporary stuff. I worked as a librarian for a while. I mm. worked for Royal Mail. Mm. Um, but essentially the big turning point for me, I, I was writing as a very, very serious hobby and my plan was always, well, I'm going to have to, you know, find other work and I was trying to balance the two. The applications won't really get anywhere. There was a huge turning point when my, my wife eventually said to me, look, this isn't really going anywhere. You're, you're writing and you're sending out job applications and nothing's happening. Why don't you just write? Mm. And that's not how I was expecting that conversation to end. Mm -hmm. But just having that faith in, in, um, in me to do that, it, it really made me commit to it. And then I sat down and I wrote Alex over the next 18 months as a fortnightly serial which he read and I think that was sort of the major point at which I, I really uh, got my head down. Oh, that's oh, a that fantastic a story. Lovely story. What's she called? Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, well, with an, Alex with an I. She's got the dedication at the front. But... Nice way to pay her back. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, I can't recommend this book more highly. It's a wonderful book to take on holiday and it will make you laugh out loud so if you read it on the plane be prepared for some very odd looks. Uh, the Universe versus Alex Woods. Gavin Exton's really nice start. Nice to meet you. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Gavin Exton's and I wrote The Universe vs. Alex Woods. Um, I would say my book is a tragic comedy. I've wanted to write um, ever since I was very young, sort of six or so. Um, and then I didn't for a very long time. I, I sort of um, went through a period of a te as a teenager being quite embarrassed about writing and it was sort of a secret um, private vice. Uh, after I graduated, I, I was a student for quite a long time, I found myself um, graduating at the beginning of the recession and I had, um, I had the idea that I wanted to write and this is really what I wanted to do, but I would work at, at the same time. Um, as it transpired, it was incredibly difficult to get a job and the writing sort of um, took over. So it was a mixture of desire and circumstance. I was sort of figured that I was in the perfect position to actually be able to pursue this dream. It felt fantastic. I can't uh, imagine um, anyone who's sort of worked on something for so long it, it not feeling that way. But um, I think I was prepared for the worst because I'd read a mountain of statistics about how difficult it was to get published. And um, I was really sort of had limited expectations. And in a way, I think that that really helped me sort of put everything into it and really go for it. And um, since then, things went much more smoothly than I could have anticipated. Um, I always wrote um, thinking I was writing for adults and I still think primarily that's what I did. Um, as I've said, I think it's just, it's it's the sort of literature I respond to. I like accessible stuff and I like stuff that um, that's sort of easy to read but isn't easy in terms of subject and I think that's why it has um, hopefully that, that broad appeal that it's something that you can um, respond to as uh, a, a young adult or teenager and um, respond to probably in a very different way uh, um, as an adult reader. And some of the books I love the most are like that. You read them as a teenager, then read them again sort of 10 years down the line. And it's just as wonderful, but completely different in terms of what you take away from the book. I absolutely love this book. It's mm -hmm. the funniest one, I think, in the collection. And there are some very funny moments in the other books, but this is just continuously funny and, and quite dramatic. I mean, the very idea that this teenage kid is the one human being on the planet to be singled out by a meteorite, to be zapped on the napper as it comes cutting through the atmosphere, is just in itself quite funny. Um, and his reaction to it, well, actually, his reaction to it is he goes into a coma mm -hmm. uh, for quite a long time, and then when he wakes up, he's epileptic. But somehow, the author makes it quite funny. Yeah. Um, because, because the kid sees it, in terms of rationality and, and, and physics, he's actually quite proud of the fact 
that he's been hit on the head mm. by a lump of space rock. And in fact, so much so that when, some, uh, when the story breaks, because he's, he's a celebrated figure, the first human being to be hit on the head mm. by a meteorite in, in human history, um, he, actually, he actually takes offence at press reports that actually the meteorite itself didn't hit him. It was maybe the rubble coming through from the roof of his house. That's what hit him on the head. Mm. So he actually gets scientists to take a reading of radioactivity from his bonds just to make absolutely sure that he's got the trace elements of a piece of space rock there, and he has. Mm. And, uh, and he has, he's actually quite pleased about it. And of course, his mother's such a comic figure as well, because she's, she's, she's the opposite of him, isn't she? Yeah, she's, she's a clairvoyant. She believes in tarot cards and fortune telling and all that sort of stuff. And he couldn't be more rational, despite what's happened to him, actually, which I would have thought would make you a bit irrational. But he is <laughs> deeply rational and scientific, and his mother is the opposite. And they're a great comic um, duo. Yes. And he, he doesn't like the celebrity status, this brief celebrity status that he has. And in fact, he gets an offer from a, a television programme called The Richard and Judy Show, um, <laughs> who offer, the producers offer to um, have his house meteor-proofed, I'm not quite sure what that is, but certainly repaired in return for um, the exclusive interview, which he declines to give, which yeah. is very wise of him. Yeah, we, offered, he would have been we apparently up. offered to retail his roof. Yes, uh, the whole thing, yeah, exactly. <laughs> which you would have done personally, uh, of course. Of course, I would have been there with my hammer and nails and <laughs> shingles and all the rest of it. Um, and then, of course, the, the story takes a wonderful turn, and then he meets this curmudgeonly old guy um, on, on a gardening allotment, and, and this chance meeting between the two of them turns into, frankly, the rest of the book, um, and it becomes a very human document, very funny, mm. um, quite exciting. He gets, gets into quite a lot of trouble with the police, um, becomes a wanted man. Um, and it's, as we said to him, it's, it, it has shades of Holden Caulfield in J.D. Salinger's Catcher in the Rye. Yes. The two characters aren't dissimilar, and he agreed with that. Yeah, because he, he, he loved the book when yes. he read it, when he was 17 himself. So, yes. yeah. And now it's time to hear from you. Here's a little bit of what's been keeping you entertained. The book I've read recently is The Secrets Between Us by Louise Douglas. When I first picked it up, I wasn't too sure. I thought it was just going to be another sort of romantic novel. Um, but when you get into it, it's a really good story and it's a real page turner. And you just can't wait to get to the end to find out what the secret is between them. Um, it's a really good book and I would recommend it to all my mates. I would like to read The Snow Child by Ewan Ivey. Um, as it's set in Alaska, I think that sounds fascinating. It, I like being transported to somewhere completely different to my normal environment. Uh, it sounds like a fascinating story and I think it's something I would really like to read. Um, I would recommend the book by Rachel Joyce, The Unlikely Pilgrimage of Harold Fry. It's about a man that receives a little note and on the back of receiving a note decides to make a pilgrimage on foot from Devon to Berwick-upon-Tweed and what he encounters and he relives his life as he does it. Um, it was recommended by my sister and already I'm thinking I can't wait to get to the end because I think it's going to be incredible. Well, we're glad you're enjoying our collections and we're delighted that uh, you're making the most of the extra content and the great offers that you can get online and in store when you buy at WH Smith. Join in our book club discussion. You can find us on Facebook forward slash Richard and Judy Book Club and we could feature you on the show. Next time on the Richard and Judy Book Club. In the non-fiction books, whoever it is writing says, you know, she did this, this and this. Yeah. A fiction writer tries to convey what it was like. Author Simon Moore tells us more about his book, The Girl Who Fell From the Sky. One not to be missed. And if you download the show from iTunes, do remember to rate the podcast. And why not check out our other shows from the collection? Until next time. We've got it all on the Richard and Judy Book Club. Love stories, historical fiction and sci-fi. Experience them all again on iTunes. Just search Richard and Judy.